Shalom, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, several of you weren't here last week, so I'm going to include some things that I spoke about last week and uh, refer back to it. This is a, a week of a, a double Parsha. Um, it's one of four. It's the first of four. You'll see later on uh, when we get into the book of uh, Vayikra and again when we're into Bamid Bar, we will see the other three. But right now we're in the first of the double parshas, and this one I want to start by reading the verses. So I want you to turn in your Tanakh to uh, Exodus thirty-five, Shmot, and we're going to look at the first three verses. Now this is only being a start. We're going to go beyond this, but I just want to get started with understanding focus. You see, in the last two, three Parshas, we've been studying the tabernacle. And we've also been looking at the, the golden calf. But there's a piece that we were missing. And that's the piece that I want to pick up because that's the first three verses of this chapter. And we'll go back later to look at the other verses in, in book of uh, Exodus in the 21st chapter. But here it begins by saying, Moses assembled the entire assembly of the children of Israel and said to them, these are the things that Hashem commanded to do them. So on the sixth day or on the six days, work may be done. And that's the key. Work may be done. But the seventh day, you shall be holy for you, a day of complete rest for Hashem. And whoever does work on it shall be put to death. And you shall not kindle fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. When I was a Christian, this was the toughest section to read and understand. And understanding, I had to change my, my looking or my view of the words that I was reading because the English does it no justice. We, we're reading what appears to be the first day after Moses comes down off the mountain for the third time. So this is Tishri, the 11th day. Yom Kippur was the day before. Now we're on the first day after Yom Kippur. Four more days and they would be moving into Sukkot, but that's not for several years yet. But the whole concept is, is that's when this actually takes place. Now, as we're looking at this, I want you to understand that what, we're look, what I want you to see is, the th is one of three. Actually, it's two of the three. I want you to understand we're going to be talking about time and space. Now, for some of you who come with me on Sundays, we've already talked about it last week when we were doing the study of uh, Shimon Bar Yochai. The Zohar talks about, well, in Zaku Takune Zohar, the rabbi spends time talking about the 70 ways that he's refracted the text of the first verse. And he took the first word apart for us a week ago in the sense that I should look at the first word and see two words there. The first of those words is the letter bet. Bet is also the number two. The second word I should see there is reshish. Reshish is about an idea. So we're going to be looking at two ideas that happened in the very beginning. Two things started at that particular point in time. Now, the whole first verse says, Bereshit bara Elohim ha'ashem ha'ashamayim ba'etz eretz, which is to say, in the beginning, God created or created God, depending on how you want to look at it. Because you see, God had no name up until this point. There was nobody to call him by anything. And so what we're looking at is the creation of a name. But the most important part is the significance of two, Hashmaim and Eretz, heavens and the earth. So in the beginning, God created two things. He created the heavens and he created the earth. But there was more to the story than just that. We can go beyond the heavens and we can go beyond the earth and talk about other things that were created in the, in the beginning, such as day and night. Both of those has heaven and earth and day and night speak of time and space. 
for a long time, they seemed to be separate. It wasn't until Albert Einstein that we created the, the, the idea of E equals MC squared. Time and energy, time and mass, time and things actually began. And so he began to close the gap on, on what the Jews understood for hundreds of years and what science is now beginning to understand. And if we go even farther than that, science is now moving to the area of understanding strings or sephirot, or the beginning of understanding the human soul. When they finally reach that point, then the Bible and science will match up. And science will become a living document as it was ever supposed to be. So we're looking at two things at the same time. But I want to go back to the beginning again, and I want to go to the second chapter and the third chapter, because I want to talk about, first off, Adam and Eve. When God created Adam and he put him in the garden, there was no tabernacle there. There was no tent there. There was no temple there. God put Adam in a garden. He told him to tend that garden. He didn't tell him to build a structure. He just told him to tend the garden. It was a time when God and Adam technically could walk together. But now, all of a sudden, we're finding ourselves in our story today, reaching the point where now what's happening? Now we have to understand that it's more than that. Now we have to understand that God has introduced something new. He introduced a tabernacle. Okay, so as we're beginning to look at this, I want you to notice again, Adam is in a garden. Conversations between Adam and God are very clear, easily understood. It's kind of like cell phone reception. You get in a good place, you got good reception. When you're in a bad place, you're in bad reception. Adam went from perfect reception to no reception because he found himself outside the garden. He now found himself outside of God's world. And it's at this point in time, Adam spends the next hundred years trying to get back to where he can hear God. Well, it won't be until later when he and Cain had gotten together and Cain told him how he was still alive, how he got to be where he was at. And Cain told, taught him how to repent. Well, now there's still no tabernacle. There's still no building. They begin to move around, but as they move around, they still manage to go through sacrifices, offerings. Remember the fact Adam sacrificed, offered? His sons offered, Cain and Abel. Where did they do it? Well, some say they did it on Mount Moriah. Others say it didn't matter. Noah would sacrifice. Abraham would sacrifice. Isaac would sacrifice. All of them did it, but there was no tabernacle. There was no temple. Was the tabernacle, was the temple necessary? As we go through the story, one of the things that we're going to find is the fact that we have to start looking at the Torah entirely differently. By that, I mean... Is the Torah chronological, or is the Torah put together the way God would have it put together? Now, do they have to be excluded, exclusive one from the other? No, but they are, because Rambam says this is all in order. There was first, we deal it this way, and now we're going to move into something different. All we're doing is just transitioning. Rashi says no. He says, first off, if we went back to, the, to this beginning of this idea of the tabernacle, he gives us the understanding of the parts of the tabernacle. Then he tells us about the, the furnishings of the tabernacle and the, what the outfits we'll be wearing are. And then he tells us a little bit more about the interior of the tabernacle. But then he stops and he teaches us about Shabbat. And then after Shabbat, we find ourselves in a dilemma because all of a sudden he's now dealing with the, uh, with the golden calf. Now he's come back down off the mountain and he begins to deal with this, not with the tabernacle, but he deals with us with the idea of Shabbat. 
Which is more important, time or place? Which? That's the dilemma that we run into as we go through our sections. So as we're looking at it, we have to understand what the tabernacle was supposed to be about. What was its purpose? We have things in the tabernacle that drive us crazy. If the golden calf was unacceptable, what would the idea of two angels sitting on top of the, of the ark? Are they not? And so there's a lot of discussion that goes on between the Gentiles and the Jews over idolatry. But that's losing track of, the, of what's going on. You see, what's really going on is we have to understand what that tent was all about. That's the first thing we really need to know. And so I want to give you an understanding of where the idea of the tent came from. But I want to do it in the order or the understanding of marriage. You see, the first couple, the ones most prominent, were Abraham and Sarah. And the most significant part of their relationship was Sarah's tent. You see, Sarah's tent was just like, just like the Mishkan, just like the tabernacle. Three things happened there. First off, one of the stories is the fact that whenever she baked bread, the bread stayed warm and fresh no matter how long it sat out. But if you went to the tabernacle, you would find that there was a table in the tabernacle. And that table in the tabernacle, well, that table in that tabernacle had bread on it. Every week that bread was replaced and new bread was put on and the old bread was taken down. And what happened? Well, they sat down to eat it. And what did they find when they ate the bread? They found it still fresh and warm. Sarah's tent was also famous for the fact that she had a light in her temple or in her tent, and that light never went out. Well, if I go to the tabernacle, what do I find? I find a menorah. Now, the menorah had seven candles in it, and literally six of them would go out. But the seventh one, the one that's said to have been east, that one never went out. The priest had to put it out in order to relight it, to fill it with oil and start it over again. Otherwise, that light would never have gone out. Well, that's not the only thing. There was another thing that was happening. You see, Sarah's tent had a cloud over it. Something that was glorious, according to the Midrash. Something like what was over the tabernacle as it traveled through the wilderness. So Abraham and Sarah's tent was the very beginning of the idea of a tabernacle. You see, the tabernacle was about a marriage. Remember at the bottom of, of Mount Sinai when they had arrived three days early and Moses had told them, prepare for what's going to happen. Well, the point in time that they're, they're working on what's going to happen, they found themselves beginning to be healed. No longer was there any limps and walking with a crutch or any of the other disabilities that one would find. They began to find themselves in one accord, hearts and minds. And not only that, according to some of the Midrashic writings, they said that at that point in time, death ceased. There was no dying. Now, if there was no dying, then we were approaching the same place that Adam found himself when he was first put into that garden. You see, now everything is lining up perfectly. Now Moses listened to the com commandments and Moses went up to receive the commandments and he received two, two sapphire Lakot tablets written on all sides. And in the course of this time, as he brings it down, he reaches the bottom. And as he reaches the bottom, he sees what's going on. And he throws the tablets to the ground, breaking the tablets. Well, why did he have to break the tablets? 
Jewish understanding is the fact that the tablets were a marriage contract. Israel was about to marry God. And in this marriage, if it had gone through, God would have indicted all of Israel for adultery. Because now they had another God. It may not have been a God to all of them. It may have simply been an, a, a leader, an Elohim, a judge. But at that point in time, that was parsing words. And so Moses threw it down. God was angry. Moses was definitely angry. He went through the process, remember, of cleaning house. 3,000 died immediately. Then they ground up the, the golden calf and mixed it with water. Water that had flown down the side of the, of the mountain. Remember how we talked about the fact that the, the tablets, the first set of tablets and the second set of tablets were not alike. That there was actually in the second set, 88 more letters, which spelled in Hebrew, the word for a brook, water. Water was streaming down off of a hot, fiery mountain that was going to be used to mix with the grinding of the gold calf. Everyone was to drink it. Many people who drank it would die because they were not outwardly showing what their display for the golden calf was, but it was inward. And so God was cleansing and he took them. But there were still others that needed more. And so a plague came upon this people. So after all of those things had happened, Moses had gone back up the mountain, received forgiveness from God, came back to share that with the people and went back up again for the next 40 days. And so he had just finished spending those next 40 days and all of a sudden he will come back down with a new set of tablets. Now, remember, I was talking about the fact that there's 88 more letters on the second set than there were on the first. Well, the difference in the text, according to the, the Kabbalistic rabbis is the fact that the first ones came from the world of Atzelut, the world of one. You see, God was creating a one nation, and everything was lining up until the golden calf. God was looking at man as becoming more perfected, but obviously we failed, or they failed. And so he had to bring down a second set of tablets in which the language changed. It was not the same as it had been because of the addition of letters, the changing of the text from one to the other. I want you to look at the, at the first text. So I want you to go back and we're going to just look at, at Shabbat. So I want you to go to chapter 31 and I want you to look at verse 12. That's where we're going to start. Okay. It begins by saying, Hashem spoke, said to Moses, saying, now speak to the children of Israel, saying, however, you must observe my Sabbaths, for it is a sign between me and you for your generations to know that I am Hashem who makes you holy. You shall observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. It's de 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 <laughs> desecrators shall be put to death for whoever does work on it. And that's a key. Whoever does work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among the people. For six days, work may be done. And the seventh day is the day of complete rest. It is sacred to Hashem. Whoever does work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. The children of Israel shall observe the Sabbath to make the Sabbath an eternal covenant between their generations. Between me and the children of Israel, it's a sign forever that the six days period, Hashem made the heavens and the earth, and for the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Now we have the seven days. Now he laid out specifically what he was thinking in, in this, this whole idea of seven days. But I want to ask you another question. Seems like I'm asking a lot of questions, but it, it seems to make sense here at this moment in time. Some have seen the tabernacle as being a monument of failure. The two temples are the same thing because God really didn't ask for it until this point in time now. Now, at the same point in time, 
he's now put forward one commandment that is most important to him, most significant. And that's the cavern, or that's the commandment for the Sabbath. So we need to spend some time looking at the Sabbath and seeing what's there. Now, in order to do that, I want you to understand we're looking at alternative history. By that, I mean, God couldn't have written these seven books the way they're written right now and given man free choice. Man could not possibly have free choice if God already knew the golden calf was going to be there. They couldn't have free choice if Korok was going to create a rebellion. They couldn't have had a Torah this way if God understood that the spies were going to make a mistake. You see, all those events that happened weren't in the original Torah. You see, God had the Torah for 2,000 years before he created the heavens and the earth. He knew the Torah backwards and forwards. But how do you write a Torah giving man free choice if he doesn't have it? What's the significance in the Torah then? What's there that we should understand has always been there? And that's the commandments. Those have been the immutable parts of the Torah. Now, he gave us a chronological history in Genesis, how we get to this point, how we change from Tishri being the first month to Nisan being the first month. We learn lots of other things. But the only thing that is really there, the blueprint for the entire Torah, are those laws. Now, I want to quibble over a word with you. The word I want to quibble over is the word called work. Six days you can work. On the seventh day, you have to rest. Is that true? Did anybody work on the seventh day? The tabernacle was busy. You see, they had to have morning and evening sacrifices every day. There was no day off. There was a constant slaying of animals, preparations. The altar of incense needed to be refueled every day. The lamps needed to be taken care of every evening. There was constant work going on there. So what does he mean by work? I want to change that one word to preparation. Preparation doesn't make sense except for the fact when we look at what's going on, give you the example, circumcision. Circumcision's allowed on the Sabbath. Well, that's work, isn't it? Well, if a rabbi comes from his house over to your house in order to perform this, the ceremony, is that acceptable? No, because the rabbi prepared for that by working moving from this place to that. In other words, everything that happens on Sabbath, all the food that's prepared on Sabbath, really began to be prepared when? Prior to the Sabbath. You know, if you were a Jew and Sabbath is coming, it doesn't seem to matter from talking to those that, when I was in Israel. It didn't seem to matter whether Evening started at 4 o'clock or 8 o'clock at night, depending on where the sun was. Because those last hours are always busy. You're always doing the last-minute things, things that could cause you to lose your mind. But in the course of time, those are all preparations that have to be done prior to it. Now, it says you can't kindle a fire on the Sabbath. Well, that's not quite right. They can't turn on fire for the Sabbath. If it's already on, it's acceptable. So there's a little leeway there. But I want to talk about fire in another way. Because you see, the rabbis understand fire 
not only that way, but they understand it to mean anger. Fire and anger do not work on the Sabbath. You see, on the Sabbath, there is no such thing as death. There is no such thing as judging someone on the Sabbath. We don't judge each other, even as B'nai Noach, on the Sabbath. We hold that. Our voices have to be quite different on the Sabbath. They are, as all said, that, 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 set, that anger was the worst sin anyone could provoke themselves to do. Because every other sin, you were dealing with a part of your body. But when you become angry, your whole body is involved. Because you just don't let it sit in your heart. You let everything out. And so fire also speaks of anger. Now, the anger that they're talking about is, is very simple. One should change from that. One should avoid that at all costs. Well, how do you avoid anger? Well, the first thing you have to understand is the fact that there is a Shabbat. How long does Shabbat last? Well, the text says, remember, the fact that do not kindle a fire. Now, the first word, do not, is actually the word lo, lamed aleph. Value, 31. The Sabbath to a Jew is not only the 25 hours in which the Shabbat actually occurs, but it's the six hours in preparation for Shabbat. Shabbat, for them, is 31 hours long. So for six hours, you're preparing yourself for that period of time when there is no fire. If you began to prepare yourself for that time, how would you be different? How would you think about talking with others? I, being a former principal, have this problem. My problem is the fact that I'm assertive. I couldn't afford to let my kids see me as somebody they could run over. So I became not indifferent because I did smile and I did talk with them and I did all those other things, but they had to see when what I looked at and I was apparently angry. My anger was exterior. My anger was never interior. Often to times I would preface. When I first started as a principal, I was allowed to paddle kids. One of your favorite lines or my favorite lines was, this is going to hurt me more than it does you. Understanding then what? That this is not about me punishing you in my anger. This is about discipline something that we're taught or supposedly taught. And that's what we're understanding. So as we're looking at what's going on with kindling fire, with the Sabbath, I want you to understand the fact that the Sabbath anger or anger on those periods of time, that 31 hours, is the most significant period of time there is. And the number one commandment for you and I is not about turning on or off lights. It's about how we behave one with another. That to me is the most important thing. You know, I, I, I've tried to talk quickly to give you time to think, but at the same time, I wanna talk about, I wanna end this with a paragraph. So I wanna begin by saying two things were immediately present in the beginning. One was the holiness of time, and the other was the holiness of a place. Since the failure of Israel on Mount Sinai, the failure has caused true holiness in terms of space. Well, it can only be found in certain places. Regarding time, we need to learn that holiness is found especially on the seventh day. Shabbat is where we can derive divine pleasure, experience for ourselves that special 
something. Now, heaven and earth were completed and God completed it and rested on the seventh day. The word for rest is the word shuv, which is the root of the word Shabbat. So we have to remind ourselves each and every time, Shabbat is about rest. That's what it's supposed to be there for. So what's the world missing? Rashi would suggest it's missing rest. When Shabbat arrives, rest comes because all our preparation has finished. We have reached that goal. So when we arrive at Shabbat, whether we've done special things or not, the idea is we need to rest. We need to change our words. We need to grow. That's the idea of peacefulness. The end. Okay. Now, those who had got copies of my lesson, it's a lot longer than what I gave, but I wanted to give you chances to talk. So I stopped there. But it's not just for that, those Shabbat and Tabernacle. If you have any questions about anything in the Parshas, both Parshas, because P- Peduke is the second half of that, glad to talk about it. But I picked Shabbat and the tabernacle for myself. So anything else you want to talk about is free. <laughs>